The topic of this pearl cast is chorioamnionitis. Simply defined, it is an infection of the chorion, the amnion, the placenta, the amniotic fluid, and potentially eventually spreading to the fetus and even the myometrium. The incidence in all pregnancies is between 0.5 and 10 percent. When you look specifically at premature deliveries, up to 50 percent of those deliveries before 30 weeks are complicated by chorioamnionitis. It is felt that an inflammation infection process led to the preterm labor. Risk factors for chorioamnionitis include nulliparity, meconium stained amniotic fluid, internal monitors, gen lower genital infections, multiple exams, and prolonged rupture of the membranes or long labors. This is primarily due to the pathogenesis. The pathogenesis is primarily an ascending infection from organisms that colonize the vaginal vault and the vaginal <coughs> body. These organisms include gram-negative, gram-positive organisms, aerobic, anaerobic organisms, especially Bacteroides and the Streptococci. Occasionally, spread to the intrauterine cavity can be hematogenous or through an amniocentesis, but by and large, ascending infection from the vagina into the uterine cavity is the mechanism of infection. The diagnosis of chorioamnionitis is predominantly a clinical one with maternal fever greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit being the necessary requirement in the absence of any other source of infection. In addition, oftentimes one of the following can also be noted. maternal or fever, <laughs> maternal or fetal tachycardia. For the mother, that would be anything greater than 100 beats per minute. For the fetus, that would be anything over 160 beats per minute. Uterine tenderness can be present, particularly in the absence of an epidural. In addition, there could be a foul-smelling discharge from the vaginal vault or cervical os. And many of these patients will also have a leukocytosis defined as a maternal white blood cell count greater than 15,000 cells per cubic millimeter. It will be important to make sure there are no other sources of infection. Differential diagnosis includes epidural fever, another viral illness, nephritis, cholecystitis, or appendicitis. All these entities must be ruled out. Once the diagnosis is clinically made for chorioamnionitis, the management is intrapartum initiation of broad-spectrum antibiotics to reduce maternal and neonatal febrile morbidity. The standard has been ampicillin and gentamicin, although a number of other agents could be used that have broad spectrum coverage. If ampicillin is used, it's two grams IV, Q4 to six hours, plus gentamicin, two milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours adjusted for ideal body weight. Tobramycin may be substituted for gentamicin, there can be single daily dosing of aminoglycoside to achieve appropriate fetal levels without maternal toxicity. If there is a penicillin or ampicillin allergy that is significant, then clindamycin, 900 milligrams IV, acute eight hours 
may be substituted for ampicillin. In addition, acetaminophen should be given to the patient to reduce hyperthermic stress, especially in the face of maternal or fetal tachycardia. Continuous monitoring of the fetus should be maintained throughout the course of intrapartum treatment. Unfortunately, many patients at term who develop chorioamnionitis experience an increased frequency of dysfunctional labor. The need for Pitocin augmentation is increased in these patients and so careful attention should be made to follow their labor curve and make sure that they are progressing appropriately on Friedman's curve. Patients with chorioamnionitis treated intrapartum should receive one dose of postpartum antibiotics if they deliver vaginally. This would be one dose of both ampicillin and gentamicin. Antibiotics can then be discontinued based on data from Dr. Patrick Duff. For patients with chorioamnionitis treated intrapartum who deliver via C-section, clindamycin, 900 milligrams IV, should be given at the time of cord clamping or just prior to the incision. No additional antibiotic prophylactic is needed. Postpartum, the cesarean patient should receive one additional dose of ampicillin 2 grams IV and gentamicin 1.5 milligrams per kilogram IV and then stop all antibiotics. Treatment failures will be defined as a patient with a single temperature after a postpartum dose of antibiotic of 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 39 degrees Celsius or two temperatures greater than 101.1 at least four hours apart. Patients identified as treatment failure should be evaluated by a physical exam and should have antibiotics begun. Ampicillin and genomycin and metronidazole are ideal for this purpose, although other antibiotic regimens that cover a broad spectrum of microbial agents could be used. If the patient is allergic to penicillin, vancomycin can be substituted for the ampicillin. This regimen of antibiotics, whichever regimen is chosen, will be continued until the woman has been afebrile and asymptomatic for at least 24 hours. Blood cultures and other diagnostic tests are performed only as deemed clinically indicated by the treating physician. In addition to the above, it is important to let the nursery and treating pediatrician be aware of the maternal diagnosis of chorioamnionitis so that appropriate follow-up can be taken on the neonate. This concludes the section on chorioamnionitis.